All right, so now we're gonna talk about um, the solutions to the Pogo equation. So what we did was, just as a recap, is we got we went over the uh, Proko Lagrangian, which is right here. And then we performed the other Lagrange equations and we got our Proko equation. We did the same thing pre in previous videos with the Dirac equation with the Dirac equation and the Klein-Gordon equation. Just as a comparison, this is what they all look like together, right? just for the ease of organization. What we want to do now, and from these, we, we found out the solutions, right? The solutions to the Klein-Gordon equation were scalars that oscillated. The solutions to the Dirac equation were also were spinners, but in their components oscillated. So let's take a look at what the Proca equation solutions look like. So we can start off by um, taking a look at just re really just rearranging this equation here to m squared a rho equals d sigma f sigma rho. All right, well, that's all fine and good. What can we do from here? Well, if we take the divergence of both sides, um, just with the dummy index, rho, a rho equals, you have to do the same thing to this side, like that. Well, this here actually turns out to be zero. And let's see why this is zero. All right, so this is zero because um, if we consider now, so I'll say d rho d sigma f sigma rho, well that equals one half, this is gonna equal one half d rho d sigma f sigma rho plus d rho d sigma f sigma rho because we're gonna, we're gonna stipulate here that um, the, the tensor, this here is um, symmetric. All right, so, which means when we're talking about symmetric tensors, if we look at it as if they were made, uh, as if it was a matrix, we have our diagonals, um, As anti-symmetric, my bad, not, not anti-symmetric. Anti-symmetric, which means that the off, these are equal but opposite to each other, the things that are on the off diagonal. So what we're doing is we're essentially adding um, half of these and subtracting half of them and then adding half. And you could you could kind of see how this how this goes. This is this really only accounts for half of what's going on. This accounts for the other half, which is why we're able to write this in this way. Okay. If you're a little bit confused on that, um, I'm, maybe I'll do a Patreon video on this, on this topic. This, re this really comes down to tensor calculus, kind of understanding how tensors move uh, or the dynamics of tensors and all this kind of stuff. But this, we're stipulating that this thing is anti-symmetric, and when we, when we do that, um, we are able to say, well, this is kind of the same thing as, um, I'm just going to go ahead and select this, and select this right here, and copy it, and paste. What we're able to do now is we're able to say that this is equal to um, minus, and then these guys become rho sigma. So we're, we're changing, and again, this is because the anti, the anti symmetric condition is that rho sigma equals negative sigma rho because again these are indices on a matrix 
right? And so we're saying that this is the minus of this, basically. Okay. Okay, well, if that's the case, then um, this turns out to be zero because this here, um, this here, they're equal and opposite to each other. So if they're equal and opposite to each other, then we get to zero. So we have to make this, so we're stipulating that this object here, that this object is an anti-symmetric object. And when we do that, we're able to say that this side here is zero. Okay? So d rho m, there's a minus sign out here, m squared a rho, Um, equals zero, All right? We can divide both sides by minus one and m squared to get that um, d rho a rho equals zero. And this is our solution. This looks very, or given that f sigma rho is anti-symmetric. If it wasn't anti-symmetric, if, if all the indices on rho or on f were able to freely be whatever they want to be, then this, is, then this will not be the case. Um, but if we stipulate that as anti-symmetric, then we get this condition, and this condition is called the Lorentz condition. Because what this is, is this is d t a t uh, minus, um, or not minus, right? This is where I'm thinking of special relativity, right? Um, plus d x uh, a x plus d y a y plus d z a z equals zero, right? And sometimes you'll see this as d a t d t equals minus the gradient of a um, some other a i, perhaps. And so. What does this mean? This is, uh, this is the Lorentz condition right here. It's, it's another way of writing the Lorentz condition. This is, um, this Lorentz condition says that um, the time derivative is equal to the negative of the spatial derivative. So wherever you have uh, this vector field and it's moving, so you can imagine what a vector field looks like. You have vectors everywhere in space, say, uh, put some more vectors in here, and say, when you say, when you say that this, um, that the time derivative is equal to the spatial derivative, you're essentially saying that um, there's a d, there's a connection between how a changes in time and how a and how a changes in space. Um, and so what this means is that if you have say a vector field and the field is moving like it's moving in a river, um, there's a deep connection <clears throat> between how vectors flow. Uh, in space, say if they're moving, say if uh, I'm, I might be getting a little bit too deep into this, but um, this Lorentz condition is a um, tells us that uh, you have um, again just uh, 
it's hard, it's kind of hard to describe a little bit for, in terms of words, but you have the space that the spatial movement of the or the, the movement of the spatial components of A is sort of intrinsically linked to the temporal component of A and how it moves. Okay, that's the Lorentz condition, and we can investigate the Lorentz condition a little bit more mathematically. I don't know why I was struggling with words to um, to to say that, but the point is, again, the point is that we stipulate that the tensor, the electromagnetic field tensor F, is anti-symmetric right here. And when we did that, we were able to say that this is the case for our A vectors. And this is the solution to our um, Proca equation, okay? Now, what is, again, what does that tell us? That tells us that the Proca equation gives rise to the Lorentz condition, okay? Given that F is anti-symmetric. It's also important to realize that F, oops, F mu nu is a function of x mu. And a rho is a function of x mu also. So these are fields. So you have a tensor located everywhere in space, and you have a vector located everywhere in space. And these give you values, specific values for Elect the electromagnetic field and the electromagnetic field potential. All right, this is the EM potential vector uh, that obeys the Lorentz condition. And this is the EM field tensor that is anti-symmetric. All right, so this is important. Um, this tells us a lot about the dynamics of our electromagnetic field. Um, a couple other things we want to note is that um, if we consider our equation of motion one more time, I'll just rewrite it, um, plus m squared a rho. Again, this was our equation of motion. Um, we can, again, if we bring this over to the, to the other side, we get this, and I'm gonna replace F with D rho A, or D sigma A rho uh, minus D rho A sigma. And from there, we get um, that, uh, if we take the divergence again, like we did, d rho m squared a rho um, actually I want to do it sigma this time. It doesn't really matter, but I'm going to put sigma here. If we did took the divergence again, oh actually my bad, oh, I'm doing something else. We just want to take this, multiply by that, and apply it to that also. And what we get is d sigma, d sigma, a rho minus d sigma, d rho, a sigma. Okay? We can rearrange these a little bit, d rho, d sigma, a sigma, 
minus d sigma d sigma a rho. I'm just flipping the derivatives because derivatives are, um, it doesn't really, it, when we're talking about vectors in this case, um, and these are functions again, where you can interchange the derivatives. They're uh, commutative. Matrices, you can't, right? But with some things you can. By doing that, we find out that this here, that's just a constant, right? That was the, that's our Lorentz condition. Um, so if that's a constant, then the derivative of that constant, well, that's just gonna go to zero. So what this means is that this is equal to d sigma d sigma a rho minus m squared a rho. This is interesting because we had a rho right here. We have a rho right here. So m plays the role of this object right here. Um, so the components of rho um, must have, um, or not the components of rho, but the this type of derivative on rho, or this, uh, this is also known as the DL inversion. Um, if you don't really know what that is, then uh, that's a little bit, that usually is taught in something that's introductory. The book didn't really, doesn't really go into it, but this is, a, this is an operator and it's associated with a, a constant. Well, what is, it? okay, well, take a look at this for a second. When we did this, if we take this to, if we take this here to the other side, we're gonna get d sigma d sigma a rho plus m squared a rho. Well, that looks an awful lot like the Klein-Gordon equation. So a sigma, or a rho, sorry, or a, the field potential also obeys So also obeys um, the Klein-Gordon equation. Okay. So I'm coming up on 20 minutes. Uh, I think the shorter the better. Sometimes uh, I'll the, in the next video we're gonna go over um, we're gonna diverge a little bit just to talk about the dis uh, dispersion relations, which is what the book does. Um, and then after that, we're going to talk about gauge symmetries. And if this, again, if this is the kind of stuff that you like watching, and if physics is something that you're very interested in, I would strongly recommend in, uh, hitting subscribe and, uh, go on visiting my Patreon page where I will event, well, I will, um, uh, have exclusive only content. Uh, where I will have content that you can specifically request if that's something you're interested in. Um, and so without, or with that being said, um, I will see you guys in the next one.